Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, leave us a rating review, and most importantly, go to quickfs.net. And if you do sign up, tell them you came from Focused Compounding. We love to use it to demonstrate a lot of things uh, on the YouTube side of our content. Uh, but Jeff and I actually do use this every single day. So if you want to sign up for that, go to quickfs.net and tell them in the checkout, you'll see a place where you could check where you heard about quick fs tell them you came and you heard about them from focused compounding so in today's podcast we're going to kind of continue on with what we chatted about in the last podcast okay. um and in this one we're going to be talking about like margin protection and also like sales protection just kind of like okay. the quality of it right we were talking about that the quality of the sales mm-hmm. uh the quality of the margins and you know this really comes it's like our minds when we first think about a company and we've asked this before in the podcast. And I've asked a lot of people this. I'm like, where does your mind go first when you look at a company? And a lot of people say, well, it goes to PE or it goes to uh, growth or it goes to, you know, whatever. And I said for myself, it typically goes to like barriers to entry, right? Um, uh, The moat of the business. Mm -hmm. Where where does your mind typically go? Yeah, I think that's true. I think we've said before, gross profitability and stuff is Mm -hmm. probably where I start with. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, our sales and gross profits higher each year. Why aren't they higher each year? Uh, things like that. I'm willing to look at any business that um, ha- isn't yet making money or has lost money or something like that. But I want to be willing to look at ones that necessarily weren't generating gross profits or weren't generating cash flow from operations, things like that. Mm-hmm. I talked about. So, yeah, I, I think just in terms of the, like you said, like the quality of uh, their their pricing power, their ability versus competition you know yeah competition um you know and like where does the moat come from right you can start Mm -hmm. to think about all these things again one thing i want to stress is that all of everything we talk about it's like when the numbers and everything it's just a lead to go and confirm and learn about the business itself so it's like where does that moat come from is it from high switching costs is it from patents is it from contracts network effects shelf space brand economy of scale uh blah 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 um or reputation right right so you know buffett he's always used the example how he talks about what he typically thinks about is you give me $10 billion, how could I hurt that person? Right. Right. And if the answer is I just couldn't do it, which he used example for like Mm Coca-Cola, that's probably a pretty uh, secure business. Right. Right. From like a competitive standpoint. And it's the nature of capitalism. And you love, I love the rant you went on, not rant, but when you talked about the total adjustable market thing, you're just like capitalism doesn't work that way. When you see a lot of these models or a lot of these analyst reports, when they talk about the TAM of a business, that's going to get competed away. Everybody likes to act like that business is going to own the entire market and just capitalism doesn't work that way. So competition right. is going to come in. So it's always good to think about certain things like that. Um, but, you know, from like the quality of the sales side and then we could go into margins, um, you know, like customer retention is very important when it comes to the sales process right. of a company. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and there are many factors that lead to that high retention. So it could be like customer behavior, uh, price and sense and sensitivity or sensitivity, mm-hmm. uh, switching costs, etc. So I'm really curious. I mean, we could just kind of go down. I mean, how do you go about doing the research on all of these sort of things? So it's like price sensitivity, right? Um, how do you judge that? How do you include that in your research? Customer retention? Well, mm-hmm. if the business has, if it's like Geico in the or, you know, progressive and they may break down these numbers or you could see in the 10k that they may say well we have long-term contracts right. things like that that could be a tip uh switching costs you know it's the customer behavior how do you typically think about analyzing uh sort of things like that um so some things can be in customer in, in the company's presentation so what you were talking about they like to do total addressable market right the other thing they some companies like to do is a lifetime value of a customer and they might be a little less likely to give you this, but the customer acquisition cost, right? So customer acquisition costs and seeing the trends in that and lifetime value of the customer is really going to matter a lot to determining whether this business makes sense or, or not. Mm-hmm. So especially when you're looking at these things, these new companies that they're promoting as being, um, uh, you know, having a lot of growth in whatever new areas there are in, with technology things or with internet things and, and all of that are usually based on some approach 
of um, that their customer acquisition cost is low enough or will be low enough versus the um, val lifetime value of the customer. But built into that is the customer retention, meaning that the customer retention has to be pretty high to make that worthwhile for them. Um, and so then you get into the things that you were talking about with so how would you retain that customer and all of those sorts of things and whether you think that they would over time. Uh, obviously, they will at first, you know, um, if you're the, not necessarily the first one, but you're the first one that gets big, uh, America Online, you would retain everyone or you would seem to have good retention rates AOL. at first. AOL. <laughs> retention rates at first, but you might not necessarily over time. So will you... Um, but one with the total address market thing is honestly, I do ask, will you attract competition? You know, we do like businesses where you can um, put a lot more capital back into the business constantly, like we're talking about with Costco. But a lot of times those kinds of businesses do attract competition, whereas smaller businesses that are more specialized will not attract competition because people won't invest in that specialized capital necessarily to win in some niche. They're not going to seek it out. Um, that niche could get eliminated through some technology change or societal change or whatever sort of thing where it's not really necessary anymore, but usually doesn't attract a lot of competition in that area, right? But you take something else, um, you take streaming music or podcasting or whatever, uh, you're going to attract tons of competition, even if you're losing money on that area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about restaurants as kind of a, a sexy industry, popular that way. Entertainment always is. It always attracts things into those industries, even if returns on capital aren't very good, right? Um, but there's lots of dull industries that are less likely to attract competition. Yeah, and you've talked about it. So it could be like a location thing. It could be mm -hmm. size, weight. You talk about like a cement plant. Right, um, sort of I was looking at a home manufacturer that makes like... Uh, home manufactured homes or whatever right and it's like this company was in florida for example and they're probably not going to compete with a home manufacturer in california because like the weight of transporting it and the cost right. and everything that goes into it so it's interesting how um things like that could really play into your competitive advantage yeah and then it gets into the the distribution or whether you want to call it they're, they're two they're kind of two separate things but the sales process and the distribution process which for a lot of companies may be similar but um how are the sales actually made and through who? Uh, that one is really big. And that's one you can do a lot of scuttlebutt on sometimes, or you could find out some things and you can compare it to other industries. And that's very important. You mentioned insurance things. Is it direct or is it through a broker? Broker, yeah. Very big difference. Um, and then depending on the kind of insurance, it's a really big difference because certain kinds of insurance can be totally different that way. Um, so when we talked about like investor's title insurance, um, that is direct in their home state. Uh, and then in other states, it's indirect and it's indirect through other people involved in the process of closings on homes and stuff. So, you know, lawyers, realtors, things like that. But we similar things with like um, uh, in the U.S. front door, uh, which has part of its business direct through realtors and stuff. I mean, part of its business direct through advertising and, and on an ongoing basis, running ads on TV and things like that. And then part through realtors of selling a home and then getting it for a little while that way. But compare that to like in the UK home serve, which is big thing is getting attached to uh, water company bills, right? That if you hear that, like the two things that we just said, so one is, okay, I bought a home, I get coverage when I buy the home for a year or something because I bought and I added it on with a deal with a realtor or something. Uh, how likely am I to uh, keep that add on? I would say low without knowing anything about it. That sounds low. You did it as part of a huge transaction mm -hmm. for a house um, for a period of time that you're locked in. And then after that, you know, whatever in that channel, then we look at it and it's not an ongoing thing that you're being billed constantly for it. Then we look at the other side, your water bill. All right. Most people don't even look at their water bill. No, they just pay it. Of all their bills, <laughs> it's not even on the level of their electricity. It's like line item. It. Yeah. No, I just pay They it. don't know what they pay for their sewer, for their whatever things and that are broken out. And so if you add on an item that's $8 a month or something for different insurance things with that, if you chose to do it initially, having it build on that basis and fold it into a water bill sounds to me like a really high retention possibility. And in fact, Billing them separately, individually as a company, sounds much less attractive than billing them on an add-on on the water thing. Now, it's an affiliated thing, and so you give a commission to the water company. So you think it's not as good. It's less direct. But it just seems like a big increase in terms of the retention possibility. You know, And then you could argue, all right, but what if you lose that? There's only a few big dominant water companies in some countries. In the U.S., it's not true. Uh, totally the opposite. But in, in a lot of countries, there's a few big water companies. In the U.S., there's scattered ones kind of of the sort of like banking in the U.S. But um, 
uh, would you lose those relationships and things like that, right? So then you worry about that. Like, what if you don't retain that as a sales channel? Um, you know, just like if a company was selling a lot of product through certain stores, you might worry, okay, if all these sales are happening through, you know, like Walmarts and things like that, is there some risk to it? But on the other hand, does it have a higher retention possibility for that reason? And so it, I think psych, you think psychologically and all the things you know, basically, it just should jump out at you right away, I think, that the difference between a sale that happens for a policy from buying a home and a sale that happens with a, a small dollar amount billed monthly, which is very frequently, on a water bill that it's folded into mm -hmm. just sounds like it should have very high retention rates. Yeah, I mean, it's just like the inertia thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people actually look at it? How many people want to go through and make changes or switch things? And uh, it's interesting how that could play into it. Um, price insensitivity is probably the best one, we, I would say. Right. From I mean, inertia is good as well, but I would say if customers are just willing to pay more for it and they don't really care, that's a huge advantage for the company. Right, and so that can come in a few different forms. You have uh, some amount of insensitivity because the price is just very low and things like that. Um, some things can be priced so low that you might even have to raise the price somewhat to make it people believe that it has value. Yeah. That happens in food things sometimes sure. where certain convenience foods and things, the actual price that the company could charge out would be so low that it would, people would just be like, I'm not going to put that in my mouth. So you have to raise the price a bit over that. But, um, and, and that gives you an idea of how attractive a price could be on something. And so that does happen. Like in the example of food companies, it happens for certain food things, whether it's condiments or frozen foods or whatever, there's some things that have to be um, raised up a bit in price just for that reason. So you have lots of pricing power versus what you, the value that you're getting. Whereas compare that to like fresh meat or something, very little pricing power. Yeah, we've talked about Virgin Cola, for example, how Richard Branson said mm -hmm. that like private taste test, people actually liked Virgin Cola more than Coca-Cola, yeah. but Coca-Cola ate their lunch because, you know, it's Coca-Cola. Yeah, his quote from that one really that was serious was uh, he said, you know, um, one even if Virgin Cola scored better in a taste test, they also liked the taste of Coke. Mm -hmm. So they said Coke tastes fine. They both got pretty good marks. Then if they asked them about the brand, even if they loved the Virgin brand, they kind of said, I like the Coke brand too, right? And then if they priced it lower, they would say, I like the price of Virgin Cola better, but they didn't have a problem with the price of Coke. So his point was, it's much, much easier to go into telecom and airlines and financial services in the UK and stuff, things that had very bad customer ratings that people didn't like, right? Mm -hmm. So there might be, uh, you might have that in some cases where people don't like uh, certain kinds of uh, in industries that they interact with, right? It would be easier to have a big customer service model going into uh, health insurance or used cars or something than going into cola. Uh, you know, trying to come up with a brand that's more attractive in cola or something, because actually most people have pretty positive things about the Coke brand. Don't mind the taste, don't mind the brand, don't mind the price. They also kind of like the brand price and taste of Pepsi. Yeah, they too. don't hate it, right? <laughs> yeah. They don't have strong opinions against it, where you want to go into industries where they do have that, where something really annoys them. And the classic one for them, right, was airlines, mm -hmm. where even the most successful airlines and stuff had very bad scores on those sorts of things, you know? Yeah, I don't think people realize how different how much airlines have changed over the past like 30, 40 years from like right. a, a customer standpoint. Yeah. Another example of that is, um, you know, satellite TV. A big part of satellite TV making inroads, I think, in some ways is because of the very um, uh, weak, uh, you, it, the dislike of cable TV for people who are still being retained by them. So they're easier customers to pick off, right? In a lot of industries, the, the most difficult thing with taking someone from an industry is if they're fundamentally pretty satisfied with it, right? But an industry that would be attractive to take people from would be one if they are retaining customers, but those customers actually are telling you that they're not very satisfied. And that was definitely happening with cable TV, where high customer retention rates for businesses that people said, I'm not very satisfied with. You know, the business you don't want, the really business that when you read about and stuff and you go, oh, this is a really tough business, is the one where people talk very high rates of uh, um, net promoter score, approval, whatever, and they aren't loyal, yeah. right? That's the one that you don't want. They, re mm -hmm. I really love that product, but I'm not that loyal to it. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite, you know, think about foods for people, foods, drinks, things like that. You're like, yes, that's my favorite brand or whatever. Oh, and I buy 10 other brands of it, mm -hmm. right? Well, like meats like that, right? Mm -hmm. So for most people, they don't have some great love of Heinz ketchup or whatever. If you ask someone their favorite um, 
you know, whatever wine or something was, it, it might even be that they have much more uh, positive things to say about that than ketchup. But actually, if you check out what different ketchups they have in their home versus what different wines they've had in their home, they're actually more monogamous with the ketchup than the wine, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and sure. So that's a bit of a risk, yeah. That's interesting. Um, customer acquisition. So strong customer acquisition can be achieved through distribution, mind share, uh, a superior product or price. So I'm curious how right. you go about researching these things as well. That's hard, right? Mm -hmm. So um, and this is all about being that investigative journalist, going yeah. and doing the research outside of the filings. Because a lot of this, you could get the lead from the numbers, but you have to do more work. Right. So like PetSmart, we did research on um, and... Uh, a lot of the research had to do with Chewy, which PetSmart eventually uh, owns now. But, uh, I mean, it's a public company, but Pet PetSmart kind of owns it. Um, so, in that case, um, there was a bit of a risk to the company, right? And oh, if over time, dog food stuff would go online. The product have no economics aren't that good for going online. But what was happening is that Chewy was having very good customer acquisition for very little spending, and I would attribute that to their uh, the CEO of, at the time there. He's not the CEO anymore. Um, and a social approach through social media and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so that is one word of mouth, social media, all those sorts of things um, where something could get a reputation and spread virally, right? So like, um, you know, how Facebook started or whatever, right? So spreading virally on a campus, spreading that way onto other campuses, reducing exclusivity over time, and then spreading across the world that way without needing to spend a lot of money on things to advertise and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas actually something like TikTok or something did spend a lot on advertising and things to try to go into different countries. Um, so what are the, you know, what is the, how does word spread of it? And how do people decide to use something that way? And how hard is it to get them to decide to use that? So a really good one would be like, um, so in some cases, uh, a sale would be hard to get into an organization, right? But additional sales within that organization would not be difficult. Um, so that could be things for data storage stuff. It could be things that back in the days of, you know, operating systems and stuff like that, where there was competition in that, um, for, for business software things, um, getting initial things to have any relationship in larger enterprises would have been difficult. But once you do getting sales that continue to grow, the account gets bigger and bigger over the years and is retained for a long time would be easier. Um, so like the, those, when we talk about sales cycle things and stuff like that, often it's going to be longer for a bigger type account, but it's going to be easier to keep. Whereas mostly I feel like what we read about today does focus a lot more on the, uh, the compounders that can come from the viral type things and mm -hmm. stuff like that, Sure, which is a, the idea of like, give it away for free, basically get it spread around people as consumer things and all that. And often it's a different approach when selling to business things. You know? It was interesting when I was reading, I remember this, um, so I was in California like a month ago and I was walking down Venice beach and I okay. saw a building. I'm like, I've seen this building before. I don't remember oh, right. where I've seen yeah. it, but I recognize it. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, holy cow, that was, I read about it. I think it was in how to turn down a billion dollars about mm -hmm. Snapchat. And that was one of their early headquarters. And they talked about in the book how it was actually a kind of a growth hack for them right. because how many people go to Venice Beach mm -hmm. and then you see the Snapchat and yep. it was kind of a cool way for them to market. So it's interesting how you could get kind of creative when it comes to customer acquisition. Right. Now for something viral, that's obviously easier to do that. If you're selling a, you know, I don't know, uh, a, a bronze Benjamin Franklin, right. you're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and that does create issues with that because like what you were talking about is it's so easy to start using it, but something like that, it's actually very hard to use all of the certain different features and things and they have to be pointed out to you by someone else and whatever, but it has to be very easy to start initially, right? You don't even need another product. You already get it on a phone that you can do that. So mm -hmm. it can take a second that way. If you're selling something where you're trying to get people to do something different with it or to need something that's a totally different product to use it, it's gonna be a much harder sell. Sure. When yeah. you mention the thing, we have about to like selling, demo it out. Right. When yeah. you mention selling a product to people like that online, that's a good example. It's very difficult because it's usually gonna start with the price, right? So in in some cases, let's take umbrellas or something. You're selling an umbrella through Amazon uh, or through anywhere. More people are probably buying umbrellas through places like Amazon stuff now than in the past. That actually probably changes the industry a bit because you're going to think 
without having it in front of you and using it and all that, you're going to be like, do I really want to spend more than $20 or whatever an umbrella? No, I don't think I do. So everyone's going to start congregating at that. And so they start from, how do I make an umbrella for $20? When in reality, it may be possible to make an umbrella that you could have for 30 years, and that'd be great. And you would be very willing to spend a lot more than that. But they will never reach those people because there's no way to sell it through that way now. And so a lot of things, and that takes on the like as seen on TV type thing, where the idea is, okay, if we get people to make this impulse buy thing, we have to start with how do we price it? We can't start with what product do people actually want and stuff. We have yeah. to work backwards from how can I price it and how can I have it explained as a problem that you can see on TV or internet or whatever without demoing it for you in person. Whereas if you were able to demo it in person and all that, you'd be more open to different prices and those sorts of things. But you have to focus in on price first and how do I sell it through things like internet, which maybe isn't the best way to sell a lot of stuff. Um, or a certain quality things and whatever. So it can be hard to achieve that. You know, Berkshire wasn't able to spread seized candies into other parts of the country and stuff, you know, and that can be difficult to sell that kind of product because it's kind of difficult to get people to try it out and what's the difference? How do you explain that to them? What What is the proposition that you make in terms of your value versus other things mm -hmm. they're like well i've had box candy or whatever well this is different well what is it different you're just like well it's better than other <laughs> things what you don't have an angle that's unique that way to be able to do it without having them to actually sample it basically sure um margin protection so margins can be protected by maintaining the gap between price and costs to analyze the margin side of a moat and everything we're talking about relates back to moat uh the key questions you want to ask yourself is does the does the company have lower costs than its competitors? So again, it's understanding right. where this all comes from, from the lead. Uh, does the company have lower costs than its competitors? Does the company have higher asset turnover than its competitors? We mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that in the last podcast. Uh, does the company have higher customer willingness to pay than its customer or than its competitors? So price and, uh, and sensitivity. Is the power of suppliers and buyers low? So we've talked a lot about that as well, like bargaining power and stuff. Um, so what do you typically think about when you are looking at the margins of a business? Obviously we want very stable margins, uh, the way right. that we typically do things, but is it just walking through to understand where that source of margin comes from? Well, I wanted to come from a value thing that you're getting out of it from the customer. Um, that is not something that's just an accident of how your, uh, costs and your revenues line up. So what I mean by that is like Buffett's talked about buying a commodity, selling a brand, it's mm -hmm. being the most attractive, and that's true. Because fundamentally, um, although it affects you for a year or two and it makes big noise in your earnings per share and people get worked about in stocks and things, if your business is buying um, sugar, corn syrup, and uh, aluminum and stuff like that and turning into a product that people are going to buy, over time it really doesn't matter a lot what the prices of sugar and aluminum do. Because they're going to do that for every other company that tries to make the same product. You, you just pass it through, right? Right. So you're going to pass it through. Um, similarly, on things like cotton or whatever, same sort of thing. There's some substitution of things that your product could be getting less attractive versus very synthetic things and whatever. But fundamentally, what they're buying is your brand and all that. So it doesn't worry me a lot that way. What worries me is there's a lot of times when someone looks at a business and just looks at the financial results. I remember this with the ethanol boom and showing you what the margins are and stuff. But the margins are totally accidental. Um, you're selling a product that's a substitute for oil using an input that has to do with food things. Corn. Right. Yeah. And so if you have prices of any of those things move, which have nothing to do with you, right? You're selling, you're buying a commodity and you're selling a commodity. And so it's just this strange trade that you're making that way. I mean, it looks like it's a business, but in terms of you buying into it as a stockholder, what are you really doing other than betting that oil prices are going to rise and corn prices are going to fall or something like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be more complicated in different cases. I'm simplifying a bit here, but a substantial amount of the profitability in certain businesses can come from stuff like that, which is really just like we're buying a commodity, we're selling a commodity. That's a very different business than what um, someone who is um, buying, a, buying commodity things and selling brands is doing or retailers and things like that who are buying um, products that have very stable pricing and selling them at very stable pricing, you know? Mm -hmm. It's it's very different. Um, it really doesn't matter in the long run for supermarkets or restaurants or something that they're buying commodity inputs. All their competitors are doing the same thing, right? But it would matter a lot and does, and sometimes people uh, do write-ups of these kinds of companies where you're doing something different that's a substitute for what they're doing. 
Um, the examples we've given before a lot that I warn about to me are always the, uh, the, th- the businesses that are a uh, byproduct. Those always worry me, right? Okay, so what do you mean? The recycling of this product mm-hmm. into that and all of those sorts of things. And people say this makes a lot of sense. You know, it makes sense at a one kind of relationship between the products and at another doesn't. So you can have the situation where it's like, okay, well, this um, they're getting this product because someone's mining this product. And as a result, some of what they're getting there, they're intending to get silver or gold or whatever, and they're getting some of this other product. We're getting some of that. We're using that to sell to someone else who's using it in, you know, whatever. Are you saying like kind of like a refiner in a way? There's uh, no, well, so when there's a lot of complexity in the refinery, then that would be true to some extent. We Mm -hmm. talked about it with, um, a good example that we talked about with that is um, Graftech. Yeah, sure. Graftech actually had a product that in some sense is a byproduct uh, that we were talking about what you would need there in that you wouldn't vary the amount of production uh, all that much because you're getting as a as a uh, byproduct ver- because you're doing something like in that case. So as an example, like you mentioned the refinery thing, yes, what you're saying is true if it was like, um, I'm trying to think of something that, well, well, we'll say heating oil or something, but heating oil is a pretty basic reason why you would be um, refining oil. But uh, let's, you say you wanted more gasoline and stuff, and so you're refining, and so you have a bunch of different products that you get out of that, right? So some of the products that you get out of it, you're getting simply because you're doing other stuff. The, the one that strikes me usually as a good example of that would be like, um, let's say you decided we're going to use... Um, we're going to use natural gas for some process in some area where they're they're using oil, uh, they're extracting oil, right? The issue there is that a lot of times the intent was not to get at the natural gas. It was to get the oil and the natural gas came along with it. So what you probably have is an unreliable supply mm. of the natural gas at that price, right? Versus having a long-term contract for natural gas that is sold as a commodity somewhere and that sort of thing. That's what I mean with the byproduct thing. I see that a lot. Um, that worries me in terms of the economics. They can look really good for a time. You know, I mean, we even wrote something out for the website, um, a company that does something like that in, in Canada where it, use, where it takes bottles of uh, glass bottles that are being Ditures. recycled. Yeah. And it, then it recycles that and goes into things for like fiberglass and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And so you have a relationship there that's set up in a better way, I think, to make money for them. But that one is something that I always would point out uh, those are relationships that may not be stable and people should be uh, aware of that on both sides, the input side and the output. Um, you know, so like the, yeah, the, but there's lots of byproduct things that way. Classic examples are like, you know, sometimes there is a use for even something like, you know, sawdust or whatever, right? Sawdust is a pure byproduct. It's not intended to be produced at all. It's just something that has to be produced and in fact has to be taken away and stuff. Um, but you can even get into more minor things uh, like dark meat chicken. In the U.S., no one wants dark meat chicken, but chickens don't come with only white meat. So you want to, if if you want to have uh, chickens, you're going to have some dark meat. You got to send it somewhere mm-hmm. um, or find some use for it. And when the country was poor and stuff, they found uses for it uh, among the population, and more and more they find uses for it in other countries and things like that. But it means that you have weird pricing of it as a as a byproduct because you just want to. If there's higher demand. Say there's higher demand for white meat chicken in the U.S., but there's not higher demand for dark meat in other countries. If that were to happen, you could just have collapsing prices on the dark meat because you're still going to increase production because what you're really doing is selling in the U.S., you know. Um, And you see lots of examples of that. Uh, Just like it's a very common, I don't know, it's a very common thing for uh, whether it's Value Investors Club or any of those sorts of things, write-ups of things, where something looks really exciting. Because they all look like service businesses. Yeah. Like very capital light, high margins. They all look great. But a lot of times people will say, well, what's the real value that you're getting here from that? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and sometimes there people can argue about what it is. So like uh, regional jet businesses or something. Uh, sometimes I don't like those kinds of things. But then we bought NACO. So they're doing a service that's set up that way. I think it's a little different um, personally than outsourcing an entire fleet to someone else where you own it. and uh, But it's a similar situation. Uh, in which a company is could be doing it all themselves and instead of outsources to someone else in a way that's totally integrated into their business. And so you can't really separate the two and you're entirely dependent on your, you know, theoretically your customer or whatever it is there um, in that relationship, that symbiosis that you have between the two of you that way, yeah. Remember reading about Arnold? 
Schwarzenegger, he would do that. They brought right. like a triple seven or something and leased yeah. it out. Well, yeah, he was one of the first to have that idea of yeah. being purely an investor in it. Yeah. And I was going to say he was like one of the pioneers. And now that's a whole that. thing. That's a whole industry. Yeah. yeah. At the time, that was something that people never considered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you judge the power of uh, the suppliers and buyers? I guess a lot of scuttlebutt is a big part of that. Also, sometimes figuring out what. Just going up the stream, talking to more people. Yeah, and a lot of times comparing it to things you've seen in other industries, I guess. That's a big part of it. Um, I think it, it it depends on the industry, but the ones that, I guess, worry me a lot when learning about a company are often if they lack a closeness to customer knowledge of certain things. And a lot of that can come out in the filings mm-hmm. and stuff like that, um, where they're letting someone else get between them, on either side, between them and their suppliers or between them and their customers. Um, and the company, you could be able to gain some information on that, worrying that the, co- the company does not have sufficient knowledge of those things and that someone could come in that way. Um, a good example would be like with, uh, so entertainment stuff with distribution, something that's changed is, uh, let's say you sell something through to Netflix, right? Now you have no knowledge. Uh, so you're producing things to have, have an end customer that an audience you're trying to serve. And now when you're going to decide to make movies and TV and things like that, you don't have good information about ratings of who's watching it uh demographics of that site graphics of that whatever they do netflix they're not giving that information away it used to be as a distributor uh into certain things you have much better knowledge of that yeah uh when you would sell things through so it used to be if paramount was distributing a movie through theaters and things they have a lot of information about that that they lack in different sorts of formats and that feeds back into production and things and all of that and i think that's a important factor and so when you want to have a lot of power that you're talking about with like suppliers or distributors or whatever it might be that we're talking about, um, having a lot of that market knowledge, competitive business knowledge is very helpful and context is very helpful. And so you want to be careful of those businesses that um, look good on the numbers or whatever, but lack a lot of those kinds of contacts and, and, and intelligence that they rely on others for, unless they have very good relationships that seem unlikely to go away over time. And then it may be fine. You mm-hmm. know, it might not be a problem that way. Um, but yeah, I would say that those are the things where it's very helpful to have that that information. Um, and that's one of the biggest ones is like, okay, so you manufacture or whatever, but then how much do you know about what you do into the final parts of it? And that's when we're talking about private label and all that. Are you lacking some information about things if you're producing, are you really just meeting the needs of Walmart or whatever when you're producing some private label thing? in a way that doesn't give you information that other competitors that you have ha- um, have in terms of the end user and all that. So we talk a lot about barriers to entry mm-hmm. and you've spoken about barriers to exit. Mm-hmm. So how do you typically think about that when it comes to the moat? Yeah, you don't want bar- you, you want barriers to entry. You, you don't want barriers to exit. The worst businesses are ones that have high barriers to exit. Because they can't get out of the industry. Because capital won't flow out of the industry, which mm-hmm. is one of your best protections. If things get bad in industry, you want capital to flow out. That's your best protection. So like what comes to mind when you think about barriers to exit, like a cruise ship? Yeah. Pretty hard to sell a billion dollar cruise ship. A long lived asset is a problem. Uh, Government involvement is a problem. Um, Easy financing. Subsidies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Various public policy things, political things. I mean, you see that that with Tesla, right? If they didn't have, you know, all these subsidies and stuff, who knows where the company would be. Right. And they might, it might, yes. So green things, that is a potential problem. Um, putting Tesla aside that way and just like green in general, it's something that's interesting when I read about where people say, here's how much, you know, green infrastructure will need and all that stuff. That's very uh, possible, very true, very exciting in terms of the amount of growth potential there. But I don't see why it would be like a lot different than um, when utilities were a growth business. So you go back to Ben um, Graham's early days in it in um, investing, the big growth business was public utility companies. And so if there's green um, infrastructure things, I don't know why the economics would be that different because there's sort of the same demands and same likely barriers to exit in terms of how long lived the, the assets are. Where if you have short lifespan assets, right, where it's all piled up in inventory and stuff, um, that's that can be gotten rid of quickly, then that can fix the industry much faster. And that you have a shorter cycle and all that. If you have, you know, when things start going bad for a shipbuilding company or whatever, where there's too much capacity of other shipyards in the area, it's very hard to turn that around, you know, mm-hmm. which is good and bad because like Buffett could get in very slowly into railroads and still enjoy a big benefit. 
because of how long that industry took to serve. Yeah. We talked about lime and cement things, and I think that things in those industries had been getting better for a period of decades. Um, and you could have invested 15, 25 years after the actual turning point, if you look back historically in terms of returns on capital and stuff, and then you had decades after that that were still good. So you could be that slow. You could be 15 years late to finding the right turning point, and people would think that you had gone in at a really smart time because the next 20 years were great. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, but those are things with high barriers to exit, right? Um, you know, the examples people always give are like steel mills, all those things, stuff that where there was very big investment in the first place. And then um, the marginal uh, advantage that you can get from producing a, something versus uh, nothing, uh, you have some benefit. And so the point at which you would actually shut things down is very um, low. I would say the bigger thing in there is it's often even worse than it appears to be that way. So they often do not even shut down the plan at that point that you're thinking of. So the point at which it would cost less to shut, uh, they would lose less by shutting down the plant than by producing anything. They still continue to produce in the assumption that, well, inventories in the industry are low, prices are low, it's never been like this, it will turn eventually. Yeah. So let's stick it out because it's cost too much to shut down the plant and then it will reopen and all of that. Eventually this will work out, so let's keep producing something here and all that. You know, um, you can see that sometimes in things like COVID and stuff, we talked a little bit about it where I mentioned um, movie theater stuff where they uh, were continuing to operate not because it, they were actually saving money, although some claim that they were saving money, but uh, that they would lose less by having some attendance. But what I know is that some really, really said um, it's too expensive to start back up again. Because at the point that we try to start back up, the labor there won't be enough labor around for us to do and all that if we don't have some staff continually. Um, so it's hard to go through a period like that to just you know say you because that's where you're thinking that would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. If that's the barrier to exit thing, if you think about it, during COVID, um, things like movie theaters and stuff didn't just for the most part shut down their entire company and said we'll wait until everyone's vaccinated or something. Although you would think that might be possible. So that gives you a good indication of lots of different industries of what companies might do. They won't do that usually. So there's enough barriers to exit that they won't do that, meaning there'll be a period where they take losses. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, can be a very big problem in some industries. And it's one to avoid. Um, most of the examples that people give are from old economy things. It's always in sort of textbooks and things, the examples they give. But I think barriers to exit are pretty high in a lot of new economy things where they lose money for long periods of time and they stick with it. Uh, there's very, for a bunch of reasons. One, in new economy things, there's nothing to liquidate, right? So there isn't much of it. I mean, it's all intangible, Buffett got so. out of textile things, but even before Buffett, Berkshire, Hathaway merging it together and shutting things down was getting out of things. New England was getting out of textiles and stuff. Um, when you have a failed... Um, uh, technology type thing now um, where you were trying to achieve a certain level of scale and you didn't and you're unlikely to ever achieve it um, the bear eggs are pretty high because it's just you're going to go out with not really having much of anything mm -hmm. you can sell to someone and they can shut it down but a lot of times there'll be too much uh, capacity I think for a while and we talked about that I mean I just get you know I what did I say last time uh meal delivery kits yeah, right yeah it was an example like once you have venture capital back a bunch of things they'll probably stay in too long so it's not like at the point where they realize oh that's too much uh we don't need that many choices in the industry that shouldn't happen uh it could take a while whereas if you really look at old economy things if you were a car company or whatever right um and they like Buffett famously said, like there were a couple thousand of them or whatever. There actually was other stuff you could go into, right? You could retool into a bunch of different other stuff. There were assets you could sell off, things like that. It might have been easier to liquidate and get out of that than in certain things now that are highly specialized. That once you start doing that, how do you pivot to something else? Mm -hmm. I mean, some tech company things do, but once you have a certain thing, you kind of may stick with that for longer than you ought to, uh, which doesn't sound like a big deal. Except what if you're what if you're invested in like the leading the leader in that who should be winning, you would think, mm -hmm. in your analysis of it that you bought into, you're like, here's this is going to be the the meal kit one that everyone of, that will beat them all eventually and survive it. Well, if they have to endure ten years of more competition than they otherwise would have had, that changes the investment completely, right? 
versus industries where people get out of it pretty fast. So getting out of it pretty fast is you have lots of um, very quickly sellable invent, uh, uh, assets that could be liquidated. That helps. You don't have unions. Um, you have uh, people, both you and others in your industry, who are very um, financially oriented and are don't are, are doing it for love of the industry that you're in um, and would be very rational that way, right? And um, then you also have uh, really not a lot of financing options for the industry. That's the best way. A credit crunch will contract the industry and stop with the, uh, that's the easiest way to kind of reduce the amount of capital in the business. And the biggest risk would be uh, loose financing into the industry, which could be government policy. It could be whatever. Yeah. But if on a continuous basis, that would be a big threat in the industry and you want to be careful. It's interesting though, when you, if you kind of follow the incentives too, like when you talk about like food delivery, for example, mm -hmm. What's fascinating about that is what's the average net margin of a restaurant, like 5% maybe, right. 5 to 8%, yeah. something mm -hmm. that's very low, right? And if you read about, like, I guess the life cycle of these food delivery companies, I think when they first launched, they would take like a 5% commission and they've jacked it up to like 30% mm -hmm. is often what it is. And you're already operating an industry that is kind of, and that's why... I know you like restaurants. I personally don't. I feel like they mm -hmm. get squeezed from every single corner, right? And now you're having like wage inflation. So they're going to get more squeezed from that as well. Yeah. And it's just, I just think it's a really freaking hard business. It's a really freaking hard industry. But if you follow incentives and I feel like oftentimes, I don't know what it is. Is it because of people look at it and say, well, there's so much, you know, what's the food industry? 1.5 trillion. Half of that is, is restaurants or whatever. Right. There's such a huge addressable market. But if you actually like, literally like right out on paper what's the business model of a of a food delivery company you're like how could this work over time if it doesn't exactly work for the restaurants over time right yes but if you don't have to be self-funding that helps uh -huh. so you get to that where it would fail right. if not yes you get to that conclusion much faster what you were saying if you believe you have to be self-funding if you believe you don't have to be self-funding you don't get to that conclusion as fast you could definitely um which sometimes can be a benefit because sometimes there is a business model at a certain size that would work and you will get to it and yeah. you wouldn't have if you had worried about producing a profit, uh, producing actual cash flows earlier. Well, that's what the pitch is. Right. And for some businesses it's worked. Mm -hmm. For others, it just means that the eventual losses you'll have will just be much bigger than they otherwise would have been. You know, the market would have naturally shut things down if there wasn't financing available by you going out of business earlier. You won't because people will consider, continue to back you right in mm -hmm. terms of financing um but i think that you know so industries in which there's the expectation of self-funding earlier would definitely be um ones that are more attractive financially that way now the downside of that is those will tend to be smaller addressable markets Let's say that it'll grow as fast and the larger probably and the larger addressable market will be the one that seems to be growing fast um, and has societal trends in that direction, all those sorts of things. But again, like getting back to incentives, mm -hmm. you've used the example a lot of WeWork. Right. You're like, I've looked at publicly traded office sharing spaces and the right. valuations are nowhere what WeWork was. Right. And like I said in that, the book about WeWork, that is an example where the-, the Billion CEO, dollar loser. The, yeah, the CEO was going through and that was the calculation he was doing in his head was how much sales will we get and what is our valuation in terms of price to sales- that we raise money at. So how much is this building worth to us? That determines what I can sign a lease for. Not how much profit will I make from it, but basically what's it worth? Just like a cable company could think like, what's a, the value in terms of price to subscriber? How much can we buy it for? If cable systems are going for $800 a subscriber, I can buy this for 400, whether I can make money on it or not, I should consider it, right? Mm -hmm. um, same sort of thing. And so that was the calculation that he was doing, but he was doing it based on thinking about um, what other people are putting on valuation on his company, right? You know, and you see that in lots of examples when they talk about, you know, sports teams and things like that. What's this thing worth? Um, it's worth what other people are going to pay for that way, not necessarily how much it produces in terms of the, the cash flows and all of that. Uh, and so, yeah, it affects your thinking about it and might keep people in a business longer than they ought to be, which doesn't, I mean, the reason why this is an issue is that it would keep all your competitors in the business continue to have a lot of capital in it that could, cause you to have problems over time um it would you know it would so from the value investing perspective it would make mean reversion harder 
mean reversion should be easier, faster, more profitable in cases where there's not a lot of funding available, right? So if you bet on the company that has the strongest financial position in an industry that's going through some terrible recession, but is trading at a discounted price to book, why does it work out? It's not some magical thing that it happens. They survive longer than their other competitors. They and their other competitors are not willing to put more capital in the business. And so the amount of capital in the business shrinks, return on capital rises, return on capital rises, people put a higher price to book on it. You know, they're using PE and stuff, but basically your price to book is now much more valuable. And that's why you have a recovery and why you do well. It, it is for that reason. That's why like net nets generally over time work is because returns on capital will get better for those worst parts of the business, just like they'll get worse usually in the best parts of the business, unless there are these big barriers, whether those are barriers to exit or barriers to entry. So when looking for a value stock thing, definitely avoid the ones with barriers to exit, mm -hmm. right? And I guess you could say when looking for the compounders or whatever, look for the um, the barriers to entry. People always talk about barriers to entry. I don't feel like we talk as much about barriers to exit, but those are the risks of really bad businesses and you don't want someone to diversify or something into an industry with high barriers to mm -hmm. exit. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure you sign up for QuickFS.net. Uh, go to QuickFS.net. Sign up for QuickFS. And when you sign up, tell them you came from Focus Compounding. Jeff and I use it every single day. Um, uh, it's really, I mean, why I like it is because it's it's very quick. There's not, I mean, there's it's just the data that you need. Mm -hmm. So it moves very quickly. Clean, very it's very simple. clean, very simple. It has all the things that we talk about here and doesn't have a lot of stuff that isn't that. Mm -hmm. And then you can also, when you become a member, you can do the download of the Excel thing and you can play around with that however you want once it's an yeah. Excel file on your own uh, computer. Absolutely. So go to quickfs.net. Tell them you came from Focus Compounding and Checkout. Helps support everything we're doing. Make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Thank you so much for all the support. And we will see you in the next podcast.